my 2024 college football win total best bets. And yes, I'll have something to say about Michigan's win total as well. Coming up next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. There's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Carter. Waits for it. Yes, caught. Hey, hey, hey. They said you can't be Ohio State. Now what? Brady gets terrific. Closer and a touchdown night again. Just before Brazil got him, and a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle, caught by Collins at the five on his feet, touchdown Michigan! On his way. It's good! He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan, but Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play, pressure coming, second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Robinson and Michigan. Winner. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And let's make some money because we have made you some money if you have been supporting us on our Patreon page over the last, what now, seven years. And we've posted these first there to give our supporters on Patreon the first chance to get these lines before they move. And then you guys get to come in later here in the broader audience. But all time on this show, our college football win total best bets are 37 17 and one that's 68 percent we're making you some money here with these win total best bets i should explain why by the way um and i and i think that this is going to become even more true with um legalization of sports wagering across the country what what you're seeing is the lines are tighter than ever before because more people are buying in and betting into them than ever before causing more line movement than ever before so unless you're doing this professionally and you're sitting there on Sunday morning hammering the openers, okay, and most of us have, you know, jobs and families that don't have time for that and are waiting around until Thursday, Friday, or even, you know, right before games on Saturdays to make plays, those lines have been bet into so many times. They're so tight. The margin there, even a lot of really good professional handicappers are, I follow, the last couple of years since legalization are having a hard time hitting 54, 55% when they were doing that in their sleep. It, to use an analogy, it's a little bit like what happened to professional poker when they started letting the internet circuit players get in. And so this is why you'd see guys like Phil Helmuth throw like tantrums because he's like playing, you know, established in-person poker rules and you don't sit there and, and, and you know, play 7-10 offsuit when someone raises the you know, pre-flop, you know, thirty percent more than the, uh, you know, than the pot, you fold. That's what a pro does. But when you're used to playing internet circuit poker, you just keep going all in every time, and you're not playing for real money. Those guys don't necessarily play by the same rules and end up beating guys like Phil Helmuth with just blind luck on draws, and that causes guys like Phil to throw tantrums. And it got it got so bad with professional poker players that they eventually just started having to play themselves, you know, and, and made for TV professional events because they kept getting destroyed by amateurs who just played by different rules. And that's similar to what's happened with wagering on games in college football and in the NFL the last few years since legalization. The lines are always tight, but even tighter than before because so many more people are betting into them. But when you talk about futures, 
Well, those markets are much softer. A lot of people can't afford to or they aren't even disciplined to make a wager in June or July and then wait until December to see if it pays off. Most people don't want to give a casino, you know, an interest free loan of their own money for five months. With They want an immediate return. Um, and those lines are not nearly as tight. Those lines are much softer and there's much more opportunity. They're still professionally done and not easy, which is why, you know, 68% is great and no one could do 88%. Okay. But there's a much higher variance in the softer lines in the futures markets than there are in the game markets. And so that's one of the reasons why I think we've been so successful with those future markets and getting out ahead of the market before they, the lines move closer to kickoff to the season. So with that, here are the eight win total best bets that I have for 2024. I'm going to start with BYU, who was on this list a year ago on the over, and it got over barely, but it did. This year, I'm under five. Some of the, the places you're going to go have it at four and a half. I'd be under at four and a half. I think they have the absolute worst offense returning in the Big 12. And in an offensive-driven league, I think that matters quite a bit. Um, I definitely think they have the worst quarterback situation in the league. I think it might uh, – and this is a program I have an immense amount of respect for. Uh, going back to Lavelle Edwards, it's had huge influence in college football. Almost every college football program these days runs some vestige of, of inspiration from the original Lavelle Edwards BYU passing attack. But I, I think that you saw them struggle to make the uh, adjustment to the Big 12 last year. The league's even deeper this year. Uh, I think you're going to see BYU go under five, and it might be the end of the Kalani Sataki era there in Provo. All right, next, I'm going to go Georgia Tech under the win total of five and a half. And, and this is strictly a perception of the market play for me. Uh, Georgia Tech has some good returning production, some good returning players on offense. But these same guys, you know, a lot's being made about the fact they got to seven and six and won a bowl game. Folks, if, if Mario Cristobal doesn't have one of the all-time coaching brain farts in the history of intercollegiate football, Georgia Tech doesn't make a bowl game last year. I mean, if he just tells you know Tyler Van Dyke to take a knee, Georgia Tech doesn't make a bowl game next year, and Brent Pry, the head coach, is one of the coaches on the hot seat heading into this year. So um, even with those players, they barely scratched out bowl eligibility a year ago. I think the schedule is tougher this year. All right, so I'm going to go Georgia Tech under five and a half to not make a bowl game. Going back to the Big 12, I'm a big Willie Fritz guy, but I'm going to go Houston under four and a half. Willie is not a quick fix coach. All right, this isn't bringing in Buddy Ryan, you know, from the old NFL days or, you know, a Jim Harbaugh coming into, a, you know, when he came into our program and we went from five and seven to 10 wins the next year. This is a slow builder. I mean, he made Tulane the premier group of five program in college football the last two years. Well, the year before that, in 2021, Tulane was two and 10. So this is a guy that believes in, you know, tearing something down to build it back up. I think they take their lumps this year. A lot of rust roster fluctuation there. Dana Holgerson did not do a good job recruiting at Houston, which is why he got canned. I mean, they should have as many advantages as any program in the new Big 12, given the region of the country they're in. I think they take those lumps this year. They play Oklahoma in the non-conference. They have two group of five games that are not gimmies. So even if they win those two games, you lose to Oklahoma, all right, um, at that point now to go over, you've got to be almost 500 in the Big 12, four and five. And, and I, I just don't see that. So I'm going to take Houston under the four and a half. All right, next. I mean, this is pretty much a perennial play for me. And I don't know why, but the odds makers keep doing this. I'm taking Iowa over seven and a half. I mean, I just, that seems to be their win total every year. Okay. You know, and Iowa wins more than seven games pretty much every year. I mean, last year they should have won 11 games. So, I mean, they've been in the Big 12, the Big 10 championship game two out of the last three years. That's who we've played two out of the last three years in the Big Ten championship game. So I, I, now the schedule is not easy, but it's the most manageable a Big Ten West program could have gotten. All right. They do play Ohio State, but then they don't play the the next, uh, you know, uh, list of murderers rows, uh, murderers row in the league. They don't play Penn State. They don't play Oregon. They don't play Michigan. Um, so that's about as fa they get Iowa State, who I think is going to be really good. Uh, both Iowa and Iowa State, by the way, are some of the leaders in the country in returning production. Uh, but they get them at home early in the year. So 
I think the schedule is very favorable. Even if you get a typical Phil Parker defense, not great, but they're not top five, they're top 15. I think even if it's Brendan Sullivan, the Northwestern transfer at quarterback, I think he's way ahead of what Deacon Hill was. They can at least be, I don't know, 90th in the in the nation in total offense. That's kind of a Kirk Ferentz media number. And that's at least to me an eight and four season at the worst. All right. So I'm taking Iowa over seven and a half. Let's uh, stay in the Midwest, but go now to the SEC. I'm going to go contrarian here and take Missouri under nine and a half. And they have they they do have a lot of returning production. It's almost all on one side of the ball. They lost at what three top 100 draft picks uh, on defense. I, I just don't think at Missouri you recruit to the level you're going to replace that. And you have to play some defense in the SEC. You you cannot score your way to 10 wins in the SEC. You have to have some level of defense. I think they take a step back there. I I just you know I don't believe you Missouri has earned the benefit of the doubt that with those kinds of losses on the defensive side, they still have a win total of nine and a half. Um, even with the more one of the more favorable schedules they have. But even last year, again, similar to what I just said about Georgia Tech, they, you know, Kansas State, they got lucky in that game and then made a 60-yard field goal to win it. Um, they had a lot of things go right to have the season they had a year ago. Um, the, a walk-on running back, and, and Cody Schrager comes out of nowhere, and he's one of the top running backs in college football. So I, I just don't see that happening two years in a row. And, I mean, Missouri could go 9-3, and three, which in Missouri football expectation world is a hella season, and I win that bet. You know, so all I need them to do is lose to Alabama and then lose to either Oklahoma and or, or Auburn, one of the two, one of those two teams, which is very realistic. And even if they're great the rest of the year, um, or lose those three games, I should say, and even if they're great the rest of the year, that's nine and three, and I win. So I'm, I think I'm going to get that bet. That's why I'm on the under. Let's go to the group of five. I'm going to take New Mexico State under five. I just think. Way too much turnover here, starting with Jerry Kill moving on, much of the rosters move on, the outstanding quarterback they had a year ago when uh, they had their first 10-win season, I think, since Nixon was president. Uh, he's gone, and I just don't think they can replace that level of personnel in one year, and I don't think they will. So I think you're going to see a lot of variance with group of five teams for the most part moving forward because they're with the transfer portal and instant eligibility, they're basically just farm teams now uh, for uh, the power conference squads. Oklahoma State over seven and a half with Iowa, one of my other favorite best bets, one of the nation's leaders in returning production. Favorable schedule again, no real non-conference game that you're like, wow, that's a that's a tough W. Uh, Mike Gundy, I think, has only won fewer than eight games twice in his career. Seventh year quarterback. They were in the Big 12 championship game a year ago. One of the best offensive lines returning in the country. One of the best linebacker units returning in the country. Arguably the best non-quarterback player returning in the country, and Ali Gordon the second. So I love Oklahoma State over seven and a half. Uh, that's one of my favorite win total best bets on the schedule as well. And then let's close it out here uh, in the Big Ten, which still seems weird to say, but I'm going UCLA under five and a half. You've got a coach that came in late that has no record at all. The previous coach didn't almost know recruiting at all. Uh, there's not much of a cupboard there. Um, uh, what's the system? They're on another offensive coordinator there. And, you know, the first time Eric bien shows he's good at this job without, uh, you know, Andy Reid to hold his hand will be uh, the, the next time he shows that'll be the first time. A brutal schedule, too. Um, I mean, they, they outside the opener against Hawaii, look at the Euclid schedule and tell me, hey, if I had to put my mortgage payment down on them on winning them on the money line, just straight up forget the line, um, which game would I pick? I, I don't. In the other 11 games, I don't know what game you would pick. I, I mean, they play a game early in the year against Indiana where you're going to Hawaii, coming home, and then you're going to go to LSU the next week. I don't know, man. I I, I think UCLA is, uh, uh, is, is picked the wrong time to pick a coach with no track record or resume given the league they're about to enter into. So I think it'll be a very difficult year for the Bruins. So I'm under five and a half with them. And those are my eight picks. My win total best bets for the upcoming season. What do you think? Let us know right here in the comments. We'll find out what our good friend Mark Rogers thinks next. One more thing I forgot. I can't leave the home team hanging. I don't want any part of Michigan's nine and a half win total. I mean, I think it's the perfect number. I, I think it's at least 80%, maybe higher. 
uh, that our final record this year is nine and three or 10 and two. Um, so that's the perfect line that, that Vegas could have created, even putting the half point on it. I mean, that's, there's a reason why they go to work every day in those, uh, Taj Mahals and, you know, we live in duplexes. Okay. So, um, I, I don't want any part of it at all. If you made me pick, made me, I take 10 and two, but I, I mean, I think it's like 54, 46 that it's 10 and two over nine and three. And, um, I, I just think that's the perfect win total that Michigan could have received. And I, I still actually think there's a realistic, if not probable chance, Michigan makes the college football playoff at nine and three. If, 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 if one of those three losses is an upset and one of those wins is against one of those marquee teams, Texas, Ohio state or Oregon, because that's going to be one of the best five wins anybody has in college football all year. If Michigan gets even one of those. And I think that'll carry a lot of weight with the committee. So I, I thought they nailed Michigan's win total at nine and a half. That's exactly where I would have put it, which is exactly why I won't play it. Well, let's get a second opinion from, well, He's deteriorating fast with every Michigan win. He is barely hanging on, and we dig that about him. He he is the last of the reasonable buck nuts, but reason reason is uh, slim and none, and it's back through the buffet line. Mark Rogers, how are you, brother? Reason just typically goes past three years, though. That that you know, reasonable people typically can count past three, and that's been my big disappointment among Michigan fans that. We're talking about one of the extraordinary uh, higher education institutions in, in the world, the University of Michigan, and these folks can't count past three. Well, apparently your university doesn't know what date last year's game was played because it didn't actually post the score of the game for like eight months, Mark. Eight months is how long it took them to post the score, so... <laughs> Uh, anyway, Mark's got a great channel you want to check out, uh, especially during the offseason. So much great news uh, with correspondents covering teams all over the country. The voice of college football right here on YouTube. And then during the season, Mark's games picks, man, are cash money, homie. All right. So his games picks are outstanding. One of the best documented records I have seen out there. And I follow this stuff now. My speciality is more of futures markets, and that's where I've done very well the last few years uh winning bets like utah 10 to 1 to win the pac 12 for example uh, i mentioned at the top of the show all time my win total best bets on this show are 37 17 and 1 all right which is 68 percent. that's pretty good and i've laid out what are my win total best bets for this season so far i may add one or two more that i'm kind of leaning towards or one way or the other we shall see but this is also mark i should note the latest i've ever come out with a batch of win total best bets usually they come out around the end of may but there's just you know with the unsettling of rosters nowadays via the transfer portal and everything else i i, I just didn't have enough of a look yet at various rosters to make that kind of call so we just came out with these uh, a little more than a week ago first on our patreon page to give our supporters an exclusive look but now we're going to give the rest of the audience a look. I ran through the picks I have so far this year and why. So I'll start with what you think now. I mean, what stood out to you, uh, both good and bad? Well, Steve, I got to say, based on those numbers, and that is about the record that I would have expected to hear out of your mouth, is that I, I'm just honored and pleased to be on the show, period, because uh, <laughs> you, you're beyond question at this point. You know, who's going to challenge you on any of these selections? And I've got to say, as I looked at these, uh, I... I would love to come with one or two where I say, okay, you missed it here, Steve, that you just somehow missed it here. What I generally have or are, are selections where I'm neutral and some other ones I, I truly like. Uh, I think Vegas, based on this sample, is, is done a nice job this off season for the most part in making it difficult on guys like you to, to find the place. Now, before we dive into the individual teams, I wanna remind some people out there that may watch me from time to time that I started to track a statistic a couple of years ago because I noticed the preseason magazines are way too conservative in making projections and record predictions. And you noted uh, recording with me a couple of weeks ago that they 
have stopped even doing it. Uh, when you look at Athlons and you look at Phil Steele in terms of making a prediction on records. But that being the case, out of the Power Five, uh, and I've looked at this for seven or eight years now, generally about 18 to 22 teams have either a win, um, increase or decrease of at least three games from one season to the other. And I quiz people all the time on this, whether they be media or they be viewers to say, how many teams do you think generally have that kind of increase or decline from one season to the next? You know, you're talking nine and three down to six and six or something of that and, and range. And that's just power conference teams you're and, talking and about. So that that's almost a third of the teams. What are there, 69 if you count Notre Dame, right? We're at 70 if we go with Notre Dame. Yeah, okay. And, and so the, the, the number last season from the 2022 campaign to 2023, 26 last season. So you, we have to really shake up what our, our bias is from taking in the previous season or what we think these teams are to, okay, we got to be visionaries here and, and see who's really going to elevate and who's going to decline. Uh, and I think that's a key portion in what you're trying to do here, of course. Uh, so starting with BYU, I'll just flat out say that, so you got BYU and Houston on the board. They obviously play, and so one of them's going to win the game. So that kind of goes against at least one twenty-fourth of your equation there. Just thought I would note that. So BYU at under five, I got to say that I think that they're going to be right on five would be my prediction right now, but I would lean a four and eight. You, of course, have the opportunity to push there. So I think you're in a good place uh, where the odds are in your favor that they're going to go four and eight instead of six and six. And we're talking about uh, schools with BYU, UCF, Houston and Cincinnati that had a rough transition into the Big 12 last season. Combined eight and 28 against the Big 12 and got regularly blown out. And so did BYU. Now, I'm going to look at Houston as well as an under four and a half. Uh, I looked at Phil Steele this afternoon. He's got him ranked as the worst team in the Big 12. Uh, they were 2-7 and seven in conference play last year, and they only had one one-score loss. They got blown out in the rest of the games. They had to win a game on a Hail Mary just to finish 4-8. and eight. Uh, So I think that's a good lean there at 4-8 and eight for Houston. Uh, they lost to Rice last year. They got to play them again this year. Uh, Looking at Georgia Tech, your selection there, Steve, at uh, under five and a half, because how bad they were uh, under Jeff Collins and early in the Brent Key tenure, I think people were impressed by seven and six, and they played Georgia well that final regular season game, won a bowl game against UCF to finish at seven and six. They were gift they wrapped. Were, they were they were gift wrapped bowl eligibility by one yes. of the dumbest coaching decisions of all time, Mario Cristobal. That's but yes. where I was headed. Yep. That's where I was headed. They were this close to being five and seven, and the narrative going from season to season would be completely different about Georgia yep. Tech. Not coming off seven and six, coming off five and seven would have been much See, different. Can, so, we, can we pause there on Georgia Tech? You know, I do a combination of situations and 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 metrics. I'm not a strict analytical guy. I'm not a strict situational guy. I think you're dealing with college athletes. There's high variance, as you just pointed out. Basically, one-fourth of power conference teams have a three-game variance one way or the other season to season, okay? And so you're dealing with emotion and and other issues, and you have to account for variance that sometimes analytics don't account for strictly, okay? So the Georgia Tech selection for me is a purely situational play. I believe they're getting overvalued because of the record they had that was gift wrapped to them by that Miami situation. And their quarterback is coming back, even though he throws a lot of interceptions. Okay. And so that to me is, I am simply saying similar to in the middle of a season, a team pulls an upset um, and over a big name team. And the next week, the big name team, maybe get them cheap because the line has dropped because of how they played the week before, and so there's value there. I I just think situationally, I think there's value on Georgia Tech to not get to a bowl game because they barely got there last year with one of the all-time greatest coaching uh, breaks, and I think that's inflated their line. So that's a case where I'm not necessarily just looking at who's coming and going and analytics, but I'm looking situationally, and I just think that their, their win total, I think, is inflated by at least a half a game. And they better get their wins early in the season. Their Mm -hmm. stretch drive is pretty brutal. North Carolina, Notre Dame, Virginia Tech, Miami, NC State, Georgia to close the season for Georgia Tech. 
Um, we love this one. We do on an annual basis, it seems, at this point. Of course, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Yeah, I mean, and they've half. been a best bet, I think, every year but one since I started doing this. Yeah. They keep burning Vegas with special teams and defense. Absolutely, they do. I think the Iowa State game at home is a game that they should win, but it's a losable game, and that's going to be possibly key in this uh, because then they run into a you know a regular Big Ten schedule. But they did miss on Oregon and USC uh, coming into the conference. There they is don't no play Michigan. Michigan State on the schedule. Basically. They've got Ohio State, and then they missed the four yeah. other best teams in the Big Ten. I mean, it's not an easy schedule, but it is the most manageable schedule a Big Ten West team could have possibly gotten. Yeah, and then the, the jury's still out on what uh, Rutgers was uh, sending to the Big Ten offices to miss Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, yeah. Iowa, and Oregon. Basically, the Big Ten office said to Rutgers, we made you play Michigan, Penn State, and Ohio State every year. Here's here, here we're, we're going to give one back. But – you know, back to Iowa for a second. Um, if the defense, again, this is where I just look at it again. Situ- well, first of all, analytically, Iowa has some of the most uh, returning production in the entire Big Ten. But if you look at it situationally, if the defense is just average of what Phil Parker does in a given year, if the offense cannot possibly be worse than it was last year, I mean, literally. Literally, if they, if they just punted on first down, all right, they're, they they now have two Big Ten starting caliber quarterbacks, and, and I'm not so sure Brendan Sullivan doesn't end up being the starter over Cade McNamara. I mean, Cade has not played a, a good game of college football really in two years now. So he's had injuries rule you know ruin two years in a row. We'll see. Sullivan was you know helped be, you know Northwestern with one of the great Cinderella stories in Big Ten history last year. Brendan Sullivan is Bronco Nagurski compared to Deacon Hill. OK, so um, if, if defensively, even if they're just at the baseline of what Phil Parker does and offensively, they're like 90th, which has kind of been their media number in the in the Kirk Ferentz era. I, I don't see how it's possible they win two fewer games than they did a, a year ago, especially when you consider that they actually should have won 11 games a year ago, which had the, what happened at the end of the Minnesota game. So. That that win total line from Vegas, if it wasn't the fact that they do this to Iowa every year, I actually would not have picked it for fear that I'm missing something. Like, this is too obvious. You know what I'm saying? They, they're not this dumb, but they actually are this dumb with Iowa virtually every single year. Their win total is basically seven and a half virtually every single year. It's like Vegas forgets the numbers when it comes to Iowa and says, we're just watching horrible football. Mm-hmm. They, they are, they're a horrible football team. They, they're ugly. We can't watch this, and therefore they're not good. Uh, put the quarterback play into this uh, context, Steve. There's not been an Iowa quarterback complete more than 60% of his passes since 2015. Brendan Sullivan, Brendan Sullivan has thrown 200 passes as a Big Ten quarterback, and he's at 69%. Yeah. He could improve that quarterback play just by making the simple throws. I agree. If, if I think if I'm Kirk Ferentz, I'm having an open quarterback competition. I I need Cade yeah. McNamara to prove to me that that he can stand in the pocket and deliver because I didn't see that even before he got hurt last year because he got hurt in that very first scrimmage and was never a hundred percent. So I'm I'm giving Brendan Sullivan every opportunity to win that job if I am Kirk Ferentz. Missouri, the darling out of the big or the uh, SEC last season, 11 and two, beat my beloved Buckeyes in the Cotton Bowl. They played really ugly football early in the year, barely beat Middle Tennessee and Memphis. Hit a 60 yard field goal to beat Kansas State. Yep. Yes. See, this is again where I'm going against the situation here. Their returning production numbers say you should play the over, and they have one of the, well, it's the SEC, so easier is in quotation marks. Okay. But. Uh, you're they lost a ton on defense they 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 have to re, they're going to they're going to replace Cody Schrager's production with the two backs they brought in but but he was just kind of an inspirational figure to that team um defensively i just don't believe missouri recruits at a level that you can replace three or four top 100 nfl draft picks in one cycle and in in that league man you're just not going to outscore people week to week to week and I think games against Auburn and Oklahoma are much tougher than people think. So I'm gonna. I think I'm again. I think I'm getting an inflated line 
You know, I don't even care what the production numbers say. If you're just telling me I that I get I get plus money betting against Missouri winning back to back double digit seasons, I'm taking it. Just sight unseen. And so that's why I made that pick with Missouri to go against the market. Yeah, five NFL draft selections overall on defense. And uh, they go through a stretch of Texas A&M, Auburn, Bama, Oklahoma. If they can navigate that in some way, the final three games are easy. They got to go six and two in the SEC. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what they're going to have to do because they're going to win the, the non-conference games because those are, they've got nobody there to deal with other than Boston College. And that's not much. Uh, I'm going to skip over New Mexico State. I've got no thoughts about them. I don't know. Uh, let's go to Oklahoma State. So you're looking at a team that brings back a seventh-year quarterback, maybe the best running back in the country, mm-hmm. and it just announced uh, here in the last day that he's not going to miss any time. One of the best offensive lines the- in the country, one of the best linebacker units in the country. Yeah. Absolutely. That was another here one. That, and I mean, Mike Gundy's won fewer than eight games in a season, I think twice his entire career. That's another one that just kind of felt like stealing to me, honestly. You know, I, I didn't it's, understand it's, that one at all. The, the non-conference is not tough. They've got Arkansas. That's their big non-conference game. So they win those three. They only go five and four right, right. in the Big 12, and they're the winner. Yeah. Uh, I will say as a, a scheduling uh, challenge to a certain extent, if there is one in the Big 12, not to diss the Big 12, but there are no elite programs and teams in the Big 12. They don't have Cincinnati, Arizona State, and Houston, so they miss some of the softies that would be complete Mm gimmies. And it is a muddled, kind of muddied league where there's not much. You throw out the three worst and the three best, and they're probably in that three best uh, quotient. Um, It's difficult to navigate the Big 12, and it should be a lot of fun. Even bringing all that back, if I get a two-game regression, I'm still over the win total. So I I just, to me, I just, I had to take that one, yeah. Then we'll make this stop at UCLA. Uh, Of course, it's just an odd situation, an odd program where the coach steps down. They replace him with a complete novice uh, in Deshaun Foster, who may turn out to be a great coach. I'm certainly not taking away from him personally, but it should not be a move that a a team that's entering the Big Ten is making. they're on their fourth defensive coordinator in four years, and the guy that they just lost, of course, DeAnton Lynn, going to USC, did a tremendous job with a defense that loses most of its best production. Uh, they do get five starters back on defense, but most of the best players are gone. Uh, two of them actually transferred across town. Uh, so that's a, a difficult situation. Their, their schedule a- their schedule is brutal, too, traveling back and forth across the country. All all the time they play LSU in the non-conference I think the the timing of that game that they have against Indiana in the Big Ten opener I would look out for that okay I mean that that strikes me as there's like 150 people in the Rose Bowl for that one you know and Kurt Signetti comes in with 31 transfers and he brings a bunch of energy and it only takes maybe 24 27 points to win that game you know what I'm saying I mean that's kind of I, I to me I, I looked at their schedule and thought outside of Hawaii tell me what's the game that you know for sure that that you would put you know your mortgage payment on UCLA on the money line like they're definitely winning that game straight up I mean I I couldn't find another game on their entire schedule where I thought that was the case yeah, from a brand standpoint, you would go to Indiana and gravitate yep. that way. But as soon as you size up that coaching situation, the, the talent between those two teams isn't much different. you mm-hmm. got a seasoned coach in Kurt Signetti against uh, a rookie. Um, yeah, that's going to be a tough one to navigate uh, starting out in the Big Ten. And on New Mexico State, as I said at the top, I mean, basically everybody that was a part of their historic season a year ago is gone. And I and I and I think where we're gonna in the future we're gonna find there's real value in the group of five uh, with their win totals because they are they they are now officially a minor league for the power conferences and the amount of talent that's going to get drained out of those group of five leagues every year is very high they're going to replenish it with FCS players and the variance on whether those guys can make the the step up or not is going to be really high. And, I mean, I think you're going to – wasn't it one year – wasn't it the year before Tulane beat USC in the Cotton Bowl? They were 0-12, okay? I, I think you're two going to – or 2-10, and 10, thank you. Uh, I think you're going to see that kind of variance in group within the group of five. Except, you know, there will be some programs that have had decades of structure, like a Toledo, for example, 
um, that have decades of structure of Appalachian State where their, you know, culture, co- coaches change, kind of like, you know, Gonzaga and college basketball, right? They're, 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 there's a culture there at that mid-major level where they know how to do it. But I think you're going to see a lot of teams – have breakthrough seasons, the coach moves on, the entire roster's in the portal, and, you know, we're going to see teams all the time, I think, at the group of five level go from three and nine to nine and three all of the time. The other talent I think you have in this, Steve, is that there are only 12 results. Therefore, this is not a Major League Baseball season where after 162 games, heck, if you're not the best team, if you've won 100 games, you're a good baseball team. If you've lost 100 games, you're a bad baseball team. It's pretty improvement yeah but that variation between like five and seven and seven and five or even four and eight and eight and four with the bounce of a ball or bad luck with injuries or a tough schedule where yeah. you get a break this season all of those just factor into a couple results three results in a 12 game uh, data point season yeah it means a lot all right before we go um for two things quickly number one give us a win total that you like um, yeah, I would have to go off your board. Uh, Iowa, I love. I, I have yet to take the deep dive uh, across the board. But uh, I'll be looking for things like two years ago when Georgia, Ohio State, and Alabama came to the table at 10 and a half. Uh, I look at that as a grouping to say, give me all three, and I'll get two out of three. Uh, and they, sure enough, uh, they hit on two out of three, and that was even the down Alabama season at 10 and two, uh, those types of plays is what I will be searching for. You know, people aren't talking enough about Georgia's schedule because of how hard Florida's is. Um, but given the caliber of roster Georgia has, they have about as tough of a schedule as you could have been given. I mean, at Ole Miss, at Alabama, at Texas, that is, I mean, that's one of the toughest road schedules in the SEC I think we've ever seen. Okay, opening up against Clemson, and it's not Clemson of five years ago, but I mean that, that's still a top fifteen program in the country. They they were given a very difficult schedule. I don't know if you've seen the stat that that uh, Bill Conley came out that uh, Florida's schedule is so hard that the average top five team in his uh, power rankings for this year would average about nine wins, nine point three wins against Florida's schedule, a top five team. Well, he, they did the same thing with Georgia's schedule. And uh, and found that uh, the average uh, top 12 team would would average about three losses as well against Georgia's schedule. But, you know, they're going to be the unquestioned preseason number one team. So before we let you go, then last thing. All right. Michigan's win total at nine and a half. I said at the top of the show, I don't want anything to do with it. It's like the perfect number. OK. And um, I, 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 I think uh, nine and three or ten and two. I'm about 90% sure Michigan's record's going to be one of those two things, you know? And so the there's just not a lot of variance there. Who knows? It's a weird schedule, too, because it's got these it, – it's not much different than last year's schedule, actually, where there was a bunch of teams Michigan could dominate and then, like, a few headliners. It's just all those games came at the end of the year, so Michigan had, like, a runway. This year, they're, they've still got kind of the same thing. There's three teams that can block them and, like, no one else can. But one of them, they got to play early in the season rather than, you know, kind of building up to it, you know, with the Texas game. So um, it's a weird schedule where I would say there's at least eight teams on our schedule that, that cannot block our defensive front. And we'll probably we could win that game with 21 points. The other three teams can at least get a stalemate. So we're going to need more points. And that's, those are the games I'm not sure about, you know, with where the offense is right now. So I, I don't want anything to do with our win total at all. But uh, what do you think? Well, I don't necessarily understand the perceived tier system in the Big Ten, where it's Ohio State and Oregon, then it's, I guess, Michigan, maybe Penn State's with them, and then on down the line, because that doesn't seem to go in line with the rankings. The rankings that everyone's coming out with has Michigan anywhere from about six to 10 in the country, and only two or three spots behind Oregon and maybe even Ohio State in the rankings. I think that if I'm going to lean one way or the other, I would have told you earlier in the offseason that I would lean that nine and a half toward the under at nine and three. But now I tend to lean more 10 and two because I don't see any game as a sure loss. And I am getting more and more confident about a win against Texas at the big house. Mm. 
I do think that USC is a bit of a threat, uh, although I think Michigan's just going to pound them into submission uh, between the tackles and just wear them down, and that's going to be difficult for USC to overcome. And I don't see anything close on Michigan's schedule to what I was looking at uh, here in the last couple of days with USC, where USC just plays a gauntlet of games that doesn't overwhelm anyone. Like, you're not going to look at it and just be, oh, that's brutal. But it's just Wisconsin. Yeah, there's very Maryland, few gimmies. Yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. Rutgers. It's, they're, t- they're all teams that could beat USC week after week after week after week that could wear them down and uh, – you know, hit them with a couple losses. And in Michigan, it's very much a traditional Big Ten schedule from the standpoint of mark your calendar, mark your calendar, mark your calendar. There it is. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Good stuff, Mark. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. All right, this week's Twitter poll results, we asked you, who is the greatest Michigan quarterback in the modern era, which I would define as post-World War II and integration. I am fine with J.J. McCarthy being number one. But 78% is obscene. I mean, Jim Harbaugh finished third in the Heisman Trophy balloting, was an All-American, led the nation in pass efficiency his junior year. Um, uh, He's the first Michigan quarterback to ever throw a touchdown pass in the NFL and be drafted in the first round. He's only getting 11%, blows my mind. But even more so, Rick Leach, the peach, getting 5%. Guys, Rick Leach was also a finalist for the Heisman Trophy. He is the only Michigan quarterback to ever start three consecutive Rose Bowls. He was the first Michigan quarterback in the modern era to beat Ohio State three times. And he held the NCAA career touchdown record for like 40 years. I, 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 first of all, I can't even believe he's not in the College Football Hall of Fame already. But there's no way he should be just at 5%. Number seven, uh, and number one in your uh, cotton pick and maize and blue hearts, Bob Eufer, should be at higher than 5%. But the people have spoken. That brings us to our feedback of the week, which I'm actually going to throw myself in there, if you don't mind, because I want to give a plug to the outstanding work done by Nick Baumgartner and Mark Snyder. I just finished their book, Mountaintop, about the 1997 National Championship season. The book is an absolute masterpiece. It brought back so many great memories that I can still remember like it was yesterday. And told me way more about what was going on behind the scenes that I didn't know as well. So bravo to those two. It is a fantastic work. If you've not read it, I would highly recommend it. Mountaintop by Mark Snyder and Nick Baumgartner about the 1997 national champion Wolverines. It's terrific. All right, that'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, share, five-star review. All those things help us to find more Michigan fans just like you, and we appreciate each and every one of you that do those things for us. You can follow us on Twitter in between episodes as well, at Michigan Podcast there, or X, I'm sorry, that's what it's called now, at Michigan Podcast on X. And that's how you'll stay up to date on what we think, all things maize and blue in between episodes. And that's the end of this episode. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue. Go Blue.